Indiana Journalism Hall of Fame writer, known for his award-winning news stories involving investigative journalism, in-depth reporting, news feature writing. He has received more than 50 state and national reporting awards. John is an author of seven books, a humorist, a narrator of the human condition, combining humor, empathy, and insights to the challenges and joys of life. His eighth book is to be published soon. He's a husband, a family man with three adult children and five grandchildren. Jim Hopp is my mentor, and he told me, keep it short, Gail. <laughs> so, Jim, I will. I'm going to turn it over to John. Hey, hey, hey. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me here today. Good afternoon. Yes. Hey, it hey. is a beautiful day. Yes. It's yes. a beautiful morning. I, I, now that I'm retired, I got to sit, sit on my porch this morning, and it was just beautiful. I had the birds coming in. But we don't. We have been having a lot of nice, gentle days like this in Indiana. It seems like we're having extremes. You know, it's it's 95 or 100, and and uh, we get these thunder showers that just come in out of no place and just you know drown us. So I've been thinking that this is we can call this the Morton Salt summer. When it rains, it pours. Yeah. So I'm really happy to be here today. One of the reasons I'm happy to be here today is because I'm supposed to be exercising right now. And uh, anything that gets me out of exercising is a good thing. Uh, my doctor won't even see me unless I exercise. And believe me, she knows. They can stick needles in you and they can tell you everything about you and you know, what you're doing. So she insists that I exercise. And she says, do you like it? I said, no, I hate it. Well, she says, think positively. She said, tell me an exercise that you really enjoy. There must be some exercise that, that you, you do like to do. And I said, well, my favorite one is pushing a door open on my way out. So that, that's where I, I get most of my exercise. I, I love coming here in Jairus to play the piano. Yeah. Uh, I hope you know that almost every organization in town he plays the piano for. Yeah. The, uh, he's, he's involved in so many things, and, and it's just always great to hear you, you play. I, I know there isn't a song in the world that you don't know. Or, or, don't tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really a lot of fun. So, I, I'm here uh, to talk a little about Purdue history. I'm going to tell a few stories because I can't tell you all 150 years of Purdue history in, in the time they've given me. They say they have a big hook here and they're going to pull me out uh, at a certain time. So, if I don't get through all the stories, you know, I'll come up to me later and I'll, I'll tell you the ones that I, I didn't get to. Uh, uh, I've had a picture up here of the, the Purdue semi-centennial. They celebrated that in 1924. Uh, that's State Street right in front of what now would be Stewart Center, our Stellar Street. Uh, uh, and you can see a big difference between what that street looked like in 1924 and today. And of course, the obvious difference is there are no orange and white construction barrels. Uh, I don't you know. That's what it looks like now. They celebrated the, the semi-centennial in 1924. Purdue opened its doors in 1874. But today, we celebrate Purdue's anniversary as the, the, the first time the legislature passed it in 1869. So our actual sesquicentennial date next year will be May 6th, and the, the anniversary date will be 2019, 150 years. That's not a very long time when you stop to think about it. You know, I'm 70 years old. I'm almost half the age of Purdue. And if you did it from this, this, when we open our doors, I am pretty much half the age of Purdue. One fairly young lifetime, you know. But we have, have had a lot of interesting history in that time. So I'll get into this. And, and uh, first, I want to tell you, I, I am doing a book for the Sesquicentennial, which I'll talk about for a second. I've done other books about Purdue. And a couple of them I've done, and I may have even talked to you about them before, are books about Purdue bands, the history of Purdue bands, and the people. And uh, I don't do stories about things. I do stories about people, books about people. And um, Dave Sattler... A good friend of mine from the Journal and Courier re retired recently. We had a little program for him, kind of a, a roast and a toast. And uh, in response, he drew a picture of me and uh, showed it to people over, the, over the, the Long Center. And he said, it's a picture of you as a member of the band. So I thought, wow, that's really cool. You know, maybe he showed me as uh, part of the snare drum group. You know, those guys that go walking down the, beating on drums. That'd be cool to be part of that group. Or part of the big bass drum group. You know, running around with those silver helmets and beating that big bass drum. 
or maybe maybe the the the, the sousaphones, you know, march, marching around, swinging those those horns and everything. But that isn't quite what he decided to do. That's not how he pictured me <laughs> as a member of the band. Whoops. <laughs> it's, it's not really a bad likeness, you know. He got the legs pretty pretty close. So this the title of this book is, is going to be. I didn't get the whole title in this picture. Is ever true? Uh, the 150 years of giant leaps at Purdue University. Giant leaps is the theme of our Cesar Centennial celebration, which will actually start in October at homecoming and run to our homecoming of 2019. So we're going to be doing a lot of celebrating. <clears throat> when, I, when I get in this history book I'm doing, I don't do very well with telling about things. I talk about people. You know, I, I like, this is not a, a high school textbook type book. It's a, it's a series of stories of people who made Purdue University what it is. Um, the only date I remember from my high school history classes is uh, 1492 because Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. If it wasn't a poem, I wouldn't even know that. So I'll start by talking a little bit about John Perdue. Uh, he isn't really our founder. He provided the money to get the university going. Actually, the founder of the university is the state. Indiana started. You all know what a land grant university is? Yes. yes. Hope you know that. So 1862, they passed the, the Federal Land Grant Act, right. providing funds providing land you could sell and get money to start a university, focusing on agriculture and engineering. And Indiana participated. It took a little while to get it going. This is John Purdue's pants. I'm the only guy who's gonna tell you this kind of stuff. Uh, his waist was uh, over 42 inches. So he was not a small person this way. He was rather small this way. He was about 5'7 and probably about 240, 250 pounds. John Perdue grew up, he was born in Pennsylvania in a log cabin, a family of 12, a couple of children died. He came to Ohio, he did pretty well in Ohio, he started as a store, uh, he met Moses Fowler, who we know, you know, he brought with him here. But he came to Purdue in the early 1830s. Why did, why did or Lafayette, why did John Perdue come to Lafayette? It's, it's not showing this, it's not show, but it's this thing right here. This is Lafayette in 1868, the canal, the Wabash and Erie Canal. In the 1830s, they were starting to build that canal up in Fort Wayne, and it was going to come down. It connected Lafayette to Lake Erie. This was a happening place, and John Pernu News, this was just on the cusp of becoming a really prosperous place. In the 1840s, there would be steamboats here from Pittsburgh, from Cincinnati, from New Orleans, from all over the place, loading and unloading. They would come in and people would come running down to the docks to see what they brought in. And they'd bring things in and they'd bring them out. It was quite a prosperous place. So John Perdue came here to be part of all that was going on. The canals that they built busted the state. They had what they said, had, I think it was called the, the Massive Improvement Projects. It was railroads, it was roads, it was canals, and they went broke. Indiana went bankrupt. In fact, they passed a law that said they couldn't have to spend ever again, and that law is still in effect. So when they passed the land grant, approved the, got part of the land grant act, the governor, Governor Baker, his name was, in 1869, went to the legislature and says, we're out of time, we've got to start this university now, or we're gonna lose the money we got from the federal government to get it started. And he gave them the good news, we're broke. He said we got about $230,000 from the land sale and we need that much more to start a university and we haven't got it. So what are you going to do? What happened was states started to bid to get the university in their community. They offered money to the state to use to get it going. So what were the three most popular choices? Indianapolis, of course, they want everything. And they, they were offering some buildings at Butler, what became Butler. Mm -hmm. Second, Bloomington. Bloomington started in 1820. They're getting ready to celebrate their, their bicentennial. Uh, Bloomington had buildings. 
Bloomington had faculty. Bloomington had an endowment. Bloomington had everything they needed to get this agricultural engineering university going on their campus. But there was some politics going on. There was a fight between the people in Bloomington and Indianapolis over land in the downtown area. And so they couldn't get together. So a third community came forth and bid to get the university. And guess what that was? Battleground. No. It was Battleground. Battleground had a Battleground Institute with about 400, 500 students going there, right by the battlefield. And they offered their facilities and land worth about $100,000. The Tippecanoe County Commission offered $50,000 in addition to that. And that was becoming a pretty good bid. And that's when all of a sudden, out of, out of no place, John Perdue, at 2 o'clock in the morning, woke up our state senator, John Stein, and said, I'm going to offer another $100,000 to put this over the top. So we had a, a $250,000 bid. It was better than anybody's. The other senators told Stein, write that up. We're going to pass it. And something happened. They brought forth the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, U.S. Constitution. The 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution gave African-American males, the women had to wait a while, males the right to vote. Indiana legislature approved citizenship for African-Americans. They, they uh, uh, were opposed to slavery. They also had a law in the books that said that no black person could enter the state, but they were not in favor of voting. So in response to the 15th Amendment, a lot of the legislatures resigned their position. Actually, didn't walk out. They resigned and left. There wasn't a quorum to finish the session. There wasn't a quorum to accept John Perdue's gift. The session just ended without a decision on where to put the land grant university. <clears throat> the governor, Governor Baker, said, none of that nonsense. You're all coming back in a month, and you're going to do the work you were sent here to do. And he did. He got them all back here in a month. They were all pretty much reelected. And this time, John Perdue knew people were going to be increasing their bids in Indianapolis and Bloomington. And so he said, I'm going to increase my bid too. He went to Battleground and said, how much more can you put up? And Battleground said, look, we're a little town. That's all we got. He came to Lafayette and said, how about some of you wealthy businessmen joining me? None of them did. So he said, okay. He upped his offer to $150,000. And he said, I will find you 100 acres of land. He didn't say he'd buy it, he didn't say it'd be his. He'd say he'd find it free to the state. Well, that turned out to be the best bid and the state accepted it on May 6th, 1869. So the story I'm telling you right now is that, except for what can only be described as racism in Indiana, Purdue University today would be located in Battleground and not in West Lafayette. Of course, it wasn't even West Lafayette then. This is the university when it first started. Over here at the far end is, is, a, is a, a residence hall for, for the faculty. Uh, next to that is, is a science building, uh, workshops. This is a, a dorm for men. And this is the, the armory. Uh, this is basically State Street. And this is, uh, this is basically, the, you know, the, uh, how, uh, um, Purdue Mall is right in this area here, the Memorial Mall, uh, the circle over there. They expected about 100 students to show up. They got 40. And then they tested them to see who was qualified. They found 13 students who were qualified. So they opened the university with 13 students, all male. They, made, they admitted women the next year. The rest of the students were put into a preparatory academy basically a glorified high school, and they, they taught them there. And that was pretty common for the land grants. One of our first interesting, really interesting people is Harvey Wiley. Some of you know who Harvey Wiley is. We have a Wiley, Wiley Hall. He was one of our original faculty. He taught chemistry and <coughs> physics. He was a medical doctor. He was just all kinds of things. Civil War veteran. First Indiana State chemist, too. Yeah. <coughs> he he, he, he got, got along with the students very well. The students loved him. He's a great teacher. He did some of the first significant research 
in Indiana into food adulterations. He also rode a bicycle. And this isn't the bicycle he rode, but this is one that Nike rode. Uh, that big front wheel and the, and the back wheel. And he would, he would live in Lafayette, he lived in Lafayette, and he would ride that bicycle over the bridge into campus every day, up that hill. Uh, quite a feat. He had trouble learning how to do it. He had the students help him uh, because they had to hold it for him to get on and catch him when he got off. Sometimes he just ran into bushes to stop himself. Uh, well, he eventually got called into the Board of Trustees. The Board of Trustees were not really all that pleased with Harvey Wiley riding his bicycle around town. So they asked him to come to one of their meetings. He thought he was going to get a raise or at least a commendation. He was a leading researcher on the campus. He was a leading teacher. He walked into the room. Everybody's deadpan. There's dead silence. He knew he was in trouble. So one of the trustees, whose name was, was Double Blower, said, the disagreeable duty has been assigned me to tell Professor Wiley we are deeply grieved at his conduct. He has put on a uniform and played baseball with the boys. He wore knickers. He also wore knickers when he rode his bikes. They wouldn't catch his browsers and the chains. Imagine my feelings and those of other members of our board on seeing one of our professors dressed up like a monkey and start a cartwheel uh, riding along our streets. Imagine my feelings when some astonished observer says to me, who is that? And I say, he's a professor at our university. So with that, while he turned in his resignation and quit. Uh, the next day they declined his resignation but he soon left anyway and went to Washington, D.C., where he had a very distinguished career. He worked in the Department of Agriculture as the chief chemist for the United States. And he was concerned about food and what was happening to food. There was a movement away from the farms into cities. Companies were starting to produce food instead of people growing their own food on farms. They were adulterating the food and they weren't telling people. There was also a lot of drugs on the drugstore shelves, cocaine, uh, morphine. There's a, a product, you know, for mother's little helper for babies that were teething. It was morphine, but it didn't say that. Wiley wanted them to, to label what they were doing to products, and he wanted to stop them doing that with some products. So they, they would put borax in meat and uh, to try and make it preserve longer. Uh, so they, they, they started calling him old borax. What he did is he got this group of young men together in the Department of Agriculture building and he fed him all these dangerous chemicals the companies were putting into the food. And as they got sick, he'd stop. They'd scientifically show that this food was making them sick. Finally, in 1906, he convinced the U.S. Congress to pass a bill, the U.S. Pure Food and Drug Act. That act still protects our food and drugs today. And he is considered the father of the Pure Food and Drug Act. He was an amazing, amazing person. Uh, he, three times he was considered for Purdue president, every time he was rejected. Once because he was too young, the other times because he wasn't married and he didn't go to church. In fact, one time he was in France in 1900, the summer of 1900, and somebody sent him a newspaper article that said Harvey Wiley's been elected president of Purdue. Mm -hmm. Well, he put the letter in his pocket and didn't think any more about it. Also didn't hear any more from anybody about it. So when he got back, you know, he started looking into it and seeing if he was in fact president of Purdue. Turns out he was not. The newspaper article was wrong. Uh, they were going to elect him president, but Benjamin Harrison, the former president of the United States, was on the board and came in and said, he's a great teacher, he's a great researcher, but he doesn't go to church, he's not married, and I can't support him. And so they decided they wouldn't have him as president. James Smart. James Smart became president of Purdue in 1883. This guy had more ideas than money. He would walk around campus, and I see him as a, as a guy who just walked fast with short steps, and people would go behind him kind of catching the ideas he would th you know, throw up in the air. Somehow he got things done. He somehow got things done. It was just amazing. He really led the university to become a great university, especially in engineering. 
Uh, there were a lot of fun things that happened back in then. This is the old pump. That's the way it looked back in 1883. This is the way it looks right now on the campus. One of the things they used to like to do, this pump was outside the ladies' hall. That's where the women, the women students lived. Women students had hours, but they could go out after hours and get a drink of water from that pump. And if they went out to get a drink of water from that pump, and their boyfriend happened to be there to get a drink too, well, what a coincidence. You know, it wasn't their fault. So the other guys on campus, when they saw one of their friends heading to the pump to meet his girlfriend, they would get there first, they would ambush him, drag him under this pump, and douse him with water and, and cool him off. Well, one day, they grabbed somebody, took him over the pump, started dousing him with water, and the guy said, stop it, stop it. I'm President Smart, don't you know what you're doing? And they had gotten the president and were, were dunking him underwater. <laughs> of course, they ran, and Smart never did anything. Uh, the, the, the kids at that time were creative as they are today. Cows appeared on the roof of buildings. They managed to get them up there. One time, Smart went to a, 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 a meeting they were having, a, a chapel, which they had every morning. And uh, he walked in, the top floor of University Hall, and he found his podium was on top of a 10-foot pile of railroad ties. And so was his Bible. And so he looked at it, and he said, well, he said, I can see you're a very creative group of engineers. He sent somebody else to get a Bible. And in the meantime, he started the people leading a song. And according to lore, he just picked a song out of the air and uh, didn't know what he was doing. I don't think that's true. He said, you know, we're going to sing song number 280, just like they did today. And they started to sing, and the song was, Blessed be the tie that binds. <laughs> well, I think he knew what he was doing. <laughs> they had guys in the dorms that were called dorm devils. They basically got everybody wet. We even got photos. And they said no faculty member with any common sense walked beneath the windows of the men's dorm because you can see the water flying down and somebody's going to get drenched. I'm going to tell one more story. And this is Amos Heflin. In, in the 1890s, Amos Hevelin was a wealthy guy from uh, uh, Frankfurt. And he said, uh, uh, I'm going to do something with my money. He said, I want to do something that's going to help people help themselves. And so he gave half his wealth to Purdue University. With that, they built a building called Hevelin Hall. That plus money from the state. It was an engineering building. Uh, it was, it was the, the crowning jewel of Purdue. They put that big tower on it as kind of an exclamation point. It didn't need it. But it was an exclamation point that said, we are here. We have arrived. We are Purdue University. We've got national publicity. It was a big deal. Four days, three days after they dedicated, it burned. Explosions in the boilers. Yeah. Smart was there. He was in tears. He watched it for a little while, went home. People in Lafayette could see it you know, from their homes. People left the opera house in Lafayette, came out and looked at it. People went over the bridge to watch it. They said it was beautiful, but at the same time, it was so tragic. This building that meant so much to them was burning down. Well, the next morning they had chapel, that same chapel where they sang the song earlier. And everybody was sitting there with their hands on their knees, looking down, and smoke was coming off their clothes and their coats. It was January. If you've ever been in a big fire, the smoke sticks to you. And you go into a room full of people and you can smell that smoke. And outside, the fire was still smoldering. And Smart you know, looked at the students, what do I say? And he said, well, he said, we're happy no one was hurt. But he said, I tell you, young men, we will rebuild that tower one brick higher. And it became a mantra of Purdue. And they did build it nine bricks higher, officially. There it is, put a clock tower in it and uh, bells. Of course, the Hevelin Hall in the 1950s was torn down. They put up a cracker box building up in its place, still called Hevelin Hall. Uh, the bells are in the tower. The clock is in an engineering building and still keeping perfect time. And I'm about to get the hook. So I'll close it off here. And if anybody have any questions you'd like to ask me?
This book will be out in March. Can we afford it? Oh, it's a little expensive. Yes. I hate to admit it, but I went to classes in that Purdue Hall before it was torn down. And then when I was at Purdue, I'm talking about Heflin Hall, at midnight it start to chime 12, and the guy and his girl would run to the fountain and back before the end of uh, the chiming of 12. And he was supposed to go to that fountain, kiss his girlfriend, at least that's what they told me he was doing, <laughs> and run back in that time. And that person who could do that was an authentic, real Boilermaker. Okay. <laughs> but that's been, I was class of 52, so. so 50. Yes. Quickly, I, I heard this, uh, the Purdue Rail Yard, the co-working space out there. When they built that first Hevelin Hall, was, was, did they put a locomotive in there? Yes, the Schenectady. Yeah. The Schenectady was in there. The, there were several of them uh, that were yeah. actually yeah. Schenectady 1, 2. And uh, beginning in the 1890s, we were the leading university probably in the world in railroad engine technology. And they ran that engine in place, you know, full steam to see what would happen, how long it would go. People went to the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, came down here and looked at our railroad uh, engineering. Actually, the railroad brakes, all the railroad brakes in the country had a, a technology that was developed here at Purdue. We were very big in railroad engine technology, which evolved in the 20th century into the internal combustion engine. We were very big in that. And what did that turn into? Aviation. Flight. Because yeah. the internal combustion engine put together with a glider, and you got flight. And that's how, how that evolved. The track used to run right down by, onto the campus around, towards uh, Evelyn Hall. The first connected they brought here, they didn't have any tracks. And uh, they called the university off for a week. And the students pushed it with the help of teams of horses. Pushed it from the railroads, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And still seated you know, on, the, on the southern end of campus, all the way over to Evelyn Hall, which is where Evelyn Hall is right now. I like that you called it a cracker box. Yeah, well, it wasn't as attractive as this, this building that oh, no, the old one wasn't. No, no. So I, I'll stay here afterwards and answer any questions you have. I uh, hope to take part in our Central Centennial activities that are coming up. We're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, there are a lot of fun stories in the history of Purdue, and uh, they're in this book, uh, which is ever true, the 150 years of giant leaps in Purdue University. Thank you very much. Thank you.